So we have on this important topic an important person and a no well-known person making my job very much easier, Dr. Ronald Miller. All of us know him and I don't want to spend any time over the introduction. And uh, he will be speaking on the master stroke in blood transfusion and update in blood transfusion medicine. Over to uh, Ronald. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is a special topic for me. Um, it, al it always has been, but it's especially important for me at the moment. And so uh, the reason it is that it takes about uh, three years or four years to develop a addition of uh, anesthesia, the textbook anesthesia. So our next edition will probably come out in about three years, I would imagine. And so I'm presently rewriting the blood transfusion chapter. And so I carefully examined the literature with regard to blood transfusions and was absolutely amazed. Uh, I made the decision there are 60 new articles that must be included in the new edition with regard to blood transfusions and that means that none of those articles were written before 2009. It's since 2009. So I have never seen in all the years I've been dealing with blood transfusions. And to just state my credibility, uh, I was on the FDA Blood and Blood Transfusion Committee for eight years. And I've chaired the University of California Committee for uh, almost 30 years on transfusions. And so I've never seen such a change evolving in transfusion medicine as it does now. And so what I might do is go through my first two or three slides, and then I'm going to skip a few so I can emphasize what is really new and what you have to pay attention to no matter what your practice of anesthesia is. That's assuming, though, that your practice includes uh, blood transfusions. So uh, with that in mind, uh, just an overview uh, with a reference of 2006. Um, how do, excuse me, how, is this the point? This is the pointer. You want a pointer? Okay, you want a, you want a separate pointer? Yeah. Oh, that's a pointer, the middle one. That's very low. That's okay, this is good enough. Okay, so it is, um, this is a reference in 2006. I think that many of these conclusions are probably correct. 80% of the world's population has access to only 20% of the world's safe blood. Um, there, at least in 2006, 150,000 uh, pregnancy-related deaths that could be prevented at access to safe blood, and so on and so forth. And so this came from uh, 2006. I actually don't know where all of the uh, areas in which you're practicing anesthesia in India uh, where they fall into this but that's what the world's numbers uh, indicate so in the in 1985 the chances for hepatitis was 10 percent in blood and the chances for HIV was uh, 0.5 percent and in 2012 if you use standard blood uh, banking stand, uh, approaches and you screen the donors properly, then the infectivity of blood has gone almost to zero. Not zero, but it is very, very rare if uh, those practices are followed. And I know what the numbers are for the United States and many countries in Europe, and this conclusion is actually amazing. So five years ago, if you had told me that most of the infectivity from blood transfusions would largely disappear, I'd say, we've won the battle. The first conclusion is correct. The second one is not correct. It seems as we win that battle, new battles arise. And so um, and the improvement in blood transfusions with regard to infectivity, it's, it's very clear why that is. It's molecular testing, viral inactivation, which we've been doing. Actually, effective, if one doesn't have all the technical information, 
uh, appropriate screening of donors is very, very important. Back when HIV was a problem, and we did not have a test for HIV, I was on a national committee trying to decide what to do, and that, that was back in the 80s, and we developed a questionnaire, didn't have the test yet, and it was amazing how effective that questionnaire was. There's no question that the testing helped a lot. But the mere fact of selecting your donors properly really uh, helps. So uh, the improvements uh, in transfusion uh, are very clear, and uh, that is molecular testing, viral and, and donor screening, and automated data systems, which keeps track of things uh, properly. So more and more, again, I don't know what it's like in India, but increasingly in the United States, the whole anesthetic process is automated uh, by computers. Being an older guy, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. But also, uh, the, the data systems are very much so able to track down which units of blood are uh, dangerous ones. And so that's really uh, important. So uh, I could go through um, many of these, this information and update you with regard to trolley and things like that, but I think I'm going to skip those slides in order to save time and then hopefully have time, uh, more time for questions. Let's see, how do I do that? And I'm going to skip. Um, uh, I should say, uh, make a comment about fresh blood and anesthesia and analgesia, December 2012. There was an article uh, reviewing uh, the advantages and disadvantages of fresh blood. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. I, I hope you do. Do you use fresh blood in the United States for blood transfusions? Pardon? You mean in India? What did I say? United States. Uh, in India, thank you. <laughs> I was, my mind was on. Uh, do you use fresh blood at all? You, so I'm getting enough nods that uh, the answer is yes. Uh, when I was in Vietnam, uh, we used fresh blood uh, regularly, and of course it has to be tested properly, but there's no question that in my eyes, fresh blood is almost a miracle in how effective it is, and, and, and it's been coming back, uh, and so there's quite a bit of interest in it now. And so this um, came in a 2012 article, and I would really strongly recommend that you read it uh, I will, I disagree with one part of it, so we'll be writing a letter to the editor. But putting that aside, it's an excellent review, and fresh blood is becoming more and more popular. So I'm sort of giving you the topic sentences without the depth behind it, uh, because there's a lot of people that would maybe argue against the use of fresh blood. And of course, nowadays, the fresh blood has to be properly tested. And so the issue is, do you use fresh blood that's not been refrigerated, or do you use fresh blood uh, that has been uh, refrigerated for a day or two? And the answer is yes and yes. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start with this, and that is uh, the indications uh, for blood transfusions, because that's now changed. So let me give you a little bit of background. And the American Society of Anesthesiologists Task Force, of which I was a member, in, uh, in 1996, uh, this is the rule that was followed. I really think uh, that this rule about transfusion medicine is widely accepted worldwide. I would guess, although I don't know that this is a standard that you use, that blood transfusions are rarely indicated uh, when the hemoglobin is more than 10 and always indicated when it's less than 6. As a general rule of thumb, Okay, so now what's changed with, as far as this concern? So uh, when, in those days, we compared 2006 with 1995, the argument against this task force report uh, was uh, they're the same as they were in 1995. And, um, and the answer is that's because there were no changes in blood transfusions at that time. That's not the case now. So. The major topics in 2012, of which all of those references that I indicated uh, revolve around, are the concept of patient blood management. Whether you read uh, the British Medical Journal 
Anesthesiology, the New England Journal, the Journal of American Medical Association, on and on, and I, uh, you can start naming all of the journals uh, in the world. Somewhere they will be talking about patient blood management. It's in vogue. So I'll quickly mention that. The transfusion trigger, what should the transfusion trigger? Do we know anything more than we did when it was, don't give it when the hemoglobin is more than 10 or less than 6? Preoperative anemia. This is really striking what the current literature says about preoperative anemia. And then the uh, terminology that is used is liberal versus um, restrictive. I made these slides right before I came, and this is an error. Restrictive versus uh, liberal uh, blood transfusion administration uh, philosophies. So the flow is incorrect. Okay, so patient blood management. Uh, I just picked one journal in which this has appeared. There are lots of journals that have published this. And so what is the goal of patient blood management? And that is the appropriate use of blood and blood components. Well, I think we've all had that goal for a long time. And the goal is to work towards minimizing the use of blood components. And uh, this is an editorial that was written in anesthesiology. Uh, this author in particular, uh, who's from the East Coast of the United States, is the author of multiple blood management uh, approaches overall. And so that's uh, what blood management is about. And so the preventative strategies that they talk about is to identify and evaluate anemia. So we're going to talk about what should be done with pre-op anemia, reduce blood losses uh, by a variety of methods, optimize hemostasis, and establish decision thresholds via hemoglobin levels. Of course, you should evaluate the fluid status and if a patient's bleeding, and we all know that. But the role of the hemoglobin is really important in their uh, approach. So with anemia, out of these four goals, the, pre, the impact of pre-op anemia is something I still don't believe, but I have to tell you this because this is what's in the literature. Uh, by the way, before uh, doing that, um, we have been studying and others uh, have been studying. You can now monitor hemoglobin continuously. If the hemoglobin becomes more and more important for transfusion uh, decisions, uh, it's a monitor that should be considered. I am not a paid consultant uh, with the company, uh, but it is one that we've been studying and published a couple of papers. Okay, so preoperative anemia, uh, quite a few articles that have appeared. But the management of anemia, pre-op anemia, is clear. Uh, you should use red cell stimulating agents and iron over a two-week period of time. Now, why are we going through this? And the answer is, it, the conclusion from all of the papers in the literature, there's a lot of them, 15 or 20 of them, and is that preoperative anemia is a risk for patient morbidity and mortality. So if a patient has anemia preoperatively, and it's not treated, uh, then they have more chances for having trouble, not so much in the operating room, but post-operatively. And so this means, I always thought that if the pre-op hemoglobin's at least 10, I can safely go ahead and give anesthesia and everything is okay. That is not what's being preached. So anybody that has anemia, which would be less than 11 or 12 grams, according to them, should have the cases uh, maybe delayed and then for two weeks use iron and various things to build up the anemia. I'm having a lot of trouble telling you this because in our hospital that's virtually impossible because most of our patients that come to our hospital come drive a long way from around Northern California or Asia and it would, they come for surgery and then for us to tell them because your hemoglobin is nine we're not going to give anesthesia and do surgery on you. We're going to wait and make you stay in a hotel room for two weeks, giving you iron and getting your hemoglobin up. That's just not going to work. But you should ignore what I just said and center on that's what is becoming the standard very rapidly, I might add. So um, this particular study, uh, the patients who had uh, a hematocrit 
of uh, less than 30 had increase of mortality and morbidity depending on the case and uh, I'll go on from there. Okay, so preoperative anemia increases morbidity in non-cardiac surgery by five-fold. This was published in anesthesiology in 2009. You can read these numbers before yourself. Pre-op anemia is indicated as less than 12 in women, less than 13. I have a hard time with this recommendation, but that's what's in the literature. Okay, should acute anemia be an indicator of transfusions? So I'm going to switch away from that now and say, uh, is anemia itself bad? Is it risky? And so one way of looking at that is to do human volunteers and you hemodilute them to a certain hemoglobin level and see how they tolerate it. And those studies have been done uh, mainly by Dick Weisskopf and was published uh, quite a few years ago. So if you have a hemoglobin induced by hemo, uh, hemodilution, you'll have an increase in heart rate, slowed reaction time, decreased self-assessed energy level. Now is that important to avoid for a patient, and I happen to think it, it is. So then, does acute anemia cause problems? Acute anemia impairs, in an awake person, cognitive function and memory, which is reversed by giving fresh blood. So my view is that if a human volunteer, not anesthetized, not undergoing surgery, is not doing too well with a hemoglobin of five or six, maybe we should not give an older person like me an older person having surgery and anesthesia and let their hemoglobin even get close to something like that. So I'm not a real believer in having the hemoglobin uh, very low uh, based on what I saw with these human volunteer studies that were done at uh, UCS at, at my place. So I'm going to move to the next terminology. Should you practice restrictive, um, another misspelled word, liberal transfusion decisions and uh, the title indicates itself. If it's restricted, you wait till the hemoglobin is uh, clearly uh, less than uh, nine, I would say, or less than 10. Uh, liberal would mean giving blood when the hemoglobin is eight to nine, and restrictive would be only when it's less than eight. And presently, you should know that the restrictive approach is the one that's highly recommended. I'm not sure, I believe this myself, but I'm just telling you what's in the literature. So that's what it is. Major problem with all of this blood management is, and I've read and reread, and I know Shander, the person that is part of it, they're always talking about the initial decision to give a blood transfusion. Nowhere in their literature can you say, well, what should the indications be if the patient is bleeding and you're continuing to give blood transfusions? What does the blood management program say about that? And they say nothing about repeat transfusions. So um, I have a problem with that. Okay, so what, what hemoglobin should be the transfusion uh, figure uh, in less than 10? And there are all sorts of people uh, that have studied this. And so I'm gonna move now to the last topic and get away from transfusion triggers uh, patient blood management. Uh, I've introduced it to you. Now it's your responsibility to find out more about it. Other than I can tell you, it's all over the literature and it's only going to grow. It's gotten popular and uh, so it's going to be big. Okay. Um, the problem that has been identified back in by many people is that older blood doesn't work well. Uh, and so uh, giving blood older than 14 days of storage, I'm not talking about getting blood from old people, but I'm talking about when you get it, uh, how long can you store it? And uh, if it's more than 14 days, you have increased post-operative complications, decreased survival after heart surgery. I sat on many of the committees when this was being studied and I asked the question, I said, uh, you know, I don't care what your data are, but I, you're convinced I don't want any blood that's more than 14 days of surgery. If you have patients that believe what I do, then the blood banking industry is in trouble. And uh, so it's a real dilemma, and I'm going to go on with this a little bit. There was an editorial in the New England Journal uh, that said uh, younger or older blood than 14 days. 
and they found also that if you gave younger blood, fresher blood, uh, that things have worked out much better. So if it is mandated to have a shorter expiration date, uh, what if the age of blood is a risk factor? Decreased blood supply with unchanged demand. How do you define who should get fresher blood? Will you accept uh, older blood if you're a patient? Those are all questions that I don't have the answer to. But if we start going down the pathway of saying that blood must be less than 14 days, these are the questions that have to be answered. There is no doubt that in a critical situation, fresher blood is better than older blood. So that conclusion is very solid. And how we manage that decision is what we have to discuss. So uh, I'm heading uh, towards the end. If you want to follow this, uh, which is what I do, if you want to follow these three topics, um, there's a website where you can get on it and they will, um, uh, the gov website is clinicaltrials.gov and you can find out what the latest information is before it's published with regard to red so uh, cell storage duration. There are studies going on, age of blood evaluation, age of blood cells in premature infants, which I don't know a lot about, but that's also being uh, discussed on uh, clinicaltrials.gov. So how do, can you keep up uh, with contemporary with blood transfusions? I'm sorry, I don't know the uh, Indian literature except when I identify an article uh, when I do a search, but the way I take uh, it, in, uh, keep up with it in the United States is uh, one uh, for the uh, New England Journal of Medicine and all the CDC uh, reports in the Journal of American Medical Association are part of my routine. Now, do I read everything in those articles? No. But it seems like in the United States anyway, when a, a new concept or a new report comes out with regard to blood transfusions, it appears in one of those uh, two journals. Okay, so I, this is my view of what the problems are. These are the new topics that will be in the transfusion uh, chapter when it eventually gets finished by me in a year or two. And uh, I want to say that I really appreciate your warm hospitality while I've been here, and I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Miller. I'm sure uh, the audience have many questions to the master. Oh. I open the topic for the audience. Is Pardon? Will you identify yourself quickly and, uh, uh, and when you be ask, brief? When you ask questions, um, I'm finding that uh, some Indian people talk pretty quickly. And so uh, if Dr. you can slow uh, it down. Kaparia, <laughs> um, my question is uh, regarding the synthetic blood. We do not know about it. What is this and how to use it? Do you have synthetic blood available in India? No. I no. doubt. No. Um, 20 years ago, I thought, quote, synthetic blood, unquote, was really going to be wonderful. I was on a couple of boards, and every approach that's been used, which there have been five or six approaches, uh, just haven't worked. And the, I, South Africa was using uh, one form of the synthetic blood. I don't know whether they're still using it or not. Uh, its problem is that it uh, routinely ends up having uh, several toxicities and the one that reappears over and over again is kidney toxicity. And so uh, my hopes for it are not very bright. Uh, Thank you. Thank uh, you very if much. If you ask me this, there, in fact, in the older articles that I've written, I've said that uh, transfusion me medicine problems will likely disappear in 20 years because we will be using synthetic blood. That statement that I have written has turned out to be false. I don't see much of a future for synthetic blood, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Okay. If I remember correctly, the artificial blood was even prematurely marketed and subsequently yes. withdrawn following yes. the... For, uh, for military purposes, yes. when it was difficult to get the fre uh, fresh or stored blood, I mean natural blood, then they wanted this to be used for military war purposes. J Japanese group, Japanese group. Yes. We'll go to the next question. 
Thank you, Dr. Miller. It's always a pleasure to hear you, sir. I had a couple of issues because blood transfusion, we all know, leads to substantial complications and now these complications are being seen in patients who receive one or two units of blood also. The risk of infection is coming down, but new types of infections are coming in. So especially these viral infections, for example, dengue, which we see very often in India, and chikungunya, for example, for which there is very little screening, goes undetected. The other thing is that there are very, very many serious problems that occurs. One common problem is surgical site infection risk increases with blood transfusion. Patients get immunocompromised and there are studies suggesting that even patients are at a greater risk of developing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now as anesthesiologists, therefore, what can we do to... Could, could I just interrupt uh, because you're naming several topics. Uh -huh. and, uh, and you keep going, then I'll forget what your first topic was. Right. So and I was I, trying let, to let say... Me just, let me just uh, finish. Your first topic is very important, and uh, I am negligent in not mentioning it. There is no question that uh, in certain parts of the United States, especially in the Southwest, and you're naming uh, some other infections uh, that Dengue might occur for which yeah, we may or may not have an assay. Will begin to appear. Metal. Will begin to appear in the blood supply, and you're absolutely correct in uh, stating that we should still have the reservations about blood, even though, at least in the United States, hepatitis and HIV is almost eliminated because other things pop up. In Southern California, we've had uh, Chagas disease, for example, that has popped into the blood supply. So you're absolutely correct. One should always be careful with blood transfusions. I just feel the need, as I frequently do, when I feel a big momentum going in one direction, I like to stay off to the side and say, well, wait a minute, don't go too rapidly. That's all I'm saying. But you're right with that uh, comment. So for patient blood management, which is becoming very popular abroad, one of the things is preoperative hemoglobin optimization which again in our country is very, very important because Indians by and large have lower hemoglobins as compared to the Western world and therefore it needs to be looked into more. And as anesthesiologists, actually in our routine day-to-day -day practice, we can reduce blood transfusion by taking care of certain things, basic things which are maybe at the risk of repetition, I would say avoiding hypothermia, for example, in long surgeries, avoiding hypertension, use of antifibrinolytic drugs. Can you be brief, please? And, Can you be brief, please? And, and yes, the transfusion triggers then defining yeah. them. And we have an interesting device here which is cheaper than this Massimo uh, thing and which uh, gives you point of care for hemoglobin estimation which right. can help. When I went through the uh, things to be uh, dealt with, uh, I skipped right over uh, what we can do. Uh, at, and you've outlined many of the approaches. There are many uh, things that we can do to optimize it so that we don't need blood, uh, the hemodilution, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't have enough of time uh, assigned to even go into those techniques. But you're right. Thank you. Thank you yeah, so much. Before I, uh, I allow Dr. Bande to have a next question, I call upon Dr. Parak. Even Dr. Miller will be surprised to receive a small token of affection and a gift who, when he visited two, almost two decades back no and problem. a stamp was released to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the modern practice of anesthesia. Okay, so I wanted, wanted to make just one quick comment in, yeah, I, where did, uh, in relationship. Uh, I can't remember how it was stated. Uh, in my slide, but optimizing interoperative um, and preoperative uh, hemoglobins in one way or another, or minimizing blood loss, optimizing the conditions during the operation. There's no question that that's part of the blood management, and I just didn't have time to go through all of that. Sorry. Dr. Parak, sir, uh, can I ask one question before that? No, you do your job first. <laughs> right. <laughs> He will be happy to see your photograph taken 20 years back. Yeah, before I allow Dr. Bande, I think you know I have a take-home message for the postgraduates. 
even though we say that the blood transfusion is safe in 2012, best thing is pro prophylaxis is better than cure. The exhaust all the measures to avoid blood transfusion. That's what then subsequently you can think of the blood transfusion. Now, Dr. Parak. Sir, uh, we work in some remote areas where blood bank facilities are not available. So, as a precaution, whenever we expect some blood loss, we get blood from the bank and keep it in our refrigerator. Now, at many times, the patient, uh, blood is not required all the time. Now, there is a tendency because blood is a scarce resource to use that blood so that it doesn't go waste. So, should we or should we not for that patient? 